Hello, boys and girls. Now, boys and girls, shall we all bow our heads and close our eyes as we say together our little KYB club prayer. Every head bowed and every eye closed. Jesus, Jesus gentle, gentle shepherd, shepherd, bless our club today. today. Keep, Keep us, us in thy footsteps, footsteps. never yeah, let us stray. Help, Help us in our broadcast every minute we pray. pray. Keep our, our minds from straying from, from thy word, word away. away. Amen. Amen. If you had a million dollars, would you give them to Jesus? The Sunday school teacher asked her pupils this question, and they all said they would. If you had $500, would you give $300 to Jesus? Yes, they all said, we would. If you had $1, would you give part of it to Jesus? The boys and girls looked at each other. Yes, said Tim. You see, Tim had no dollar. I would, said Jerry, and he took a quarter out of his pocket and offered to give it. The others kept quiet. They had a dollar at home, but they didn't want to give part of it away, not even for missions. The children all said they would give a million because they didn't have it, but most of them didn't want to give what they could. You know, it's easy to say what we would do for Jesus if we had a million. But how much will we do for Jesus with what we have? Oh, that's the real question and the real test, isn't it? Our love of God is shown by what we're willing to do for him right here and now. And our giving doesn't have to be just money. Love makes us want to do things for Jesus. And Jesus wants us to give money or anything else to him because we love him, not because we think we have to. The Bible says God loves a cheerful giver. Cheerful givers are people who give because they want to. Their love makes them happy givers. And I think that's a good verse for our memory verse this week, don't you? 2 Corinthians 9, 7. God loves a cheerful giver. Now here's some little cheerful singers, the Sunbury Junior Singers from the Salvation Army in England, and they sing This Little Light of Mine.
the Bangles' house. Say please and we'll let you out. No, you only get in. I'm not gonna say please. We're not gonna let you out. I'll tell you I'll scare and I'll break the door down. What are you kids doing? Why is Joey screaming like that? We told him to say please and we'd let him out. But he won't say please. Why do you have him in there? We were playing cowards and he wanted to play with us. We didn't want him, so we made him a villain and put him in jail. You big boys are always teasing him, just because he's littler than you are. You should be ashamed of yourselves. If Mom were home, she'd give it to you good. We were just playing with him and fooling around. We wouldn't really hurt him. But you have hurt him sometimes when you've been fooling around. And Mom says you make him naughty with all your teasing and fooling around. Listen, he's not yelling and kicking at the door anymore. Joey, are you going to say please like a good boy? If you do, we'll let you out. That's funny. I wonder why he's so quiet. Maybe he's fainted or yelled so much he got sick. People who get too excited to have heart trouble. You kids better open that door. Joey? Joey? Where are you? He's not here. Look what he did. He put that ladder up to the window and he climbed out. Joey? Joey? Oh, Joey, where are you? Where'd a little kid like that go? Over to Mrs. Bartano's. But Joey wasn't at Mrs. Bartano's house. He wasn't in the park either. Billy, Patty, and Paul searched the neighborhood, but they couldn't find him. Daddy came home from the office and he wanted to know just what had happened. We locked Joey in the basement. We were just playing. But he was yelling and kicking and everything. The boys wouldn't let him out. After a while, we opened the basement door, but Joey was gone. He climbed up the ladder and out the window. We looked at everywhere and we can't find him. Dad, you don't think something could have happened to Joey? I'm scared. Well, I'll admit I'm a bit scared too, but we'll have to trust the Lord to help us find him. We can ask Jesus to help us find Joey. He's too little to be alone. I wish Mom were home. Daddy, Jesus knows where all our things are. We can ask Jesus to help us find Joey. Yes, we certainly can. I've been praying quietly to myself, but I think we should stand right here under this tree and pray together. There's power in united prayer. So you three children pray hard in your hearts while I talk to Jesus out loud. So right outdoors under a tree, Billy, Patty, Paul, and Daddy Bangle bowed their heads to pray. You know, God has said, before you call, I will answer. And it was certainly true in this case. Just as they bowed their heads, they heard a voice calling to them. I want to pray too. It's Joey. Daddy, look where he climbed to. Way up there on that high branch. He's never gone that high in the tree before. Joey, what are you doing up there in the tree? I'm hiding from Billy and Paul. They locked me in the basement, but I got out. Well, didn't you hear us calling you? Yes, but I'm hiding. Young man, you get right out of that tree. I've got a good notion to warm your backside for causing so much trouble. Dad, it was really my fault for locking him in the basement. But Billy, I'm the one who suggested it. But I didn't have to do just because you suggested it. We didn't know we'd cause all this trouble, did we? We sure didn't. We thought we were just having some fun. But I guess teasing little kids isn't the best kind of fun for kids as big as we are. Dad, please don't punish Joey. Punish me. I'm the one who deserves it. And if you punish Bill, you better punish me too. Billy and I both teased Joey and we both locked him in the basement. Well, I guess maybe there's been enough punishment for one day. But remember, no more of this ganging up of you big boys against little Joey. And Joey, you listen to me. When you hear me calling, you answer. Do you hear that? Even when I'm way up in a tree? Yes, and that's another thing. I don't want you climbing on those high branches. Hi, I'm home. Come on in. I've got some real fresh donuts. It's nice seeing you all together. I bet you had fun while I was away. I wish you could have seen the looks that passed between Billy, Patty, Paul, and Mr. Bangle. But do you know... Even little Joey forgot to tell Mom about being locked in the basement and climbing the tree. 
I think it's a good idea to forget bad things after they're straightened out, don't you? The Bible says, whatsoever things are lovely, think on these things. Once upon a time, there was a boy named Will who was chosen by the king to care for his castle and his garden. The king gave Will the key of the only door in the high wall which surrounded the castle and garden, and then he went away and left Will in charge. One day, as Will was working the garden, he was surprised to see the face of an ugly man appear suddenly over the top of the wall. Will was lonely, so he talked with the ugly one, and after this the man often came to talk to Will. Will began to spend so much time talking to the man that the garden was neglected. The man offered to come and help Will look after it if he would only open the door and let him come inside. One day Will decided to open the door, and the man slipped in and wouldn't leave. So Will shut the door and locked it up. The man started to work in the garden. He worked so hard that there was no use for Will to work. Then one day the man told Will some of the fruit trees were old and asked if he might cut them down and plant new ones. Will felt sure the king wouldn't like it, but at last he consented. The new trees grew fast. The fruit on them looked nice from a distance, but left a bitter taste when eaten. Will was never satisfied. He ate more and more, so he grew fat and began to get ugly. In fact, he began to look like the man who had planted the trees. The trees which now grew in the garden of the castle bore hate apples, grapes of lies, selfishness plums, pears of pride, crab apples of gossip, berries of jealousy and ingratitude, beside many other such horrid fruits. Will finally decided, after seeing his sinful face in a mirror, that he would eat no more fruit. But he couldn't stop eating. One morning, as Will walked unhappily up and down the garden paths, he heard a gentle knocking at the door. Where was the key for the door? At last he found it. The ugly man told Will to leave the door locked, but Will fitted the key in the lock and threw open the door. And there stood the Savior, a crown of thorns on his head and nail prints in his hands and feet. When Will saw that tender, loving, glorious face, he fell upon his knees begging the Savior to come in quickly. As the Savior came in, the ugly man slunk through the gate and disappeared. The Savior planted beautiful trees in the place of the evil ones which had been wrecking Will's life. As Will ate of those new fruits, love, joy, peace, goodness, gentleness, and others, his face changed until it became pleasant and kind. Do you understand this story of Will? The Savior, of course, is the Lord Jesus Christ, and Will is the name of someone who lives in the castle of your body, which by right belongs to Jesus Christ. The one who planted all those horrid trees in Will's garden is Satan, and he will plant them in your garden, too, if you'll let him. The garden is your life. The mirror, which showed Will his sinfulness, is the Bible. The key which opened the gate is the key of prayer. And you know you may use that wonderful key today and ask the Lord Jesus to come in and save you as he saved Will in our story. Jesus will destroy Satan's horrid fruit trees and plant his own beautiful fruit trees in your garden if you'll only let him. Why don't you let Jesus come in right now? Why, it's our singing lady, Carol Wiersma, come to sing for us. Bible.
child is too little for Jesus to love, too little of Jesus to learn. No child is too little his dear love to know, too little that love to Goodbye, singing lady. We'll be waiting for you again next time. I'll be a sunbeam for him. And now, here's Liz and his little wooden friend, Ricky. Ricky, did you have a good time at the beach today? Yeah, I did, but I feel sorry for Jane. What happened to Jane? Well, she was swimming, and as she was walking out of the water, she cut her foot on a big piece of broken glass, and it was bleeding real bad. Boy, you know, Ricky, that really teaches us a lesson, doesn't it? Well, what kind? Not to walk on the beach? No. To be very careful that we don't throw things in the water, like bottles that break, and junk. You know, Ricky, I was walking one day out along one of the streams near our place, and I saw all kinds of cans and paper boxes and garbage bags of all kinds of things, uh, vegetables and things that people didn't want anymore, and they just threw them over the bank into the stream. And I thought to myself, boy, oh boy, how much junk has gone into this stream before and is starting to kill the fish and, and some of the other animals that drink the water. Yeah, and we were talking in school just before summer vacation about all these big factories that are around the lakes and around the rivers that are dumping chemicals and some of their waste materials into the water. And just downstream a little bit from all these factories, we're finding dead fish and I remember, too, that when we were reading in one of the newspapers in class, they were talking about some of these big ships that were dropping the oil over the side, and the oil would come up and cover up some of the wild ducks or geese that were swimming around, and, and it killed them. Ricky, there again, it, I think it teaches us a real good lesson about being good stewards of what God has given us. Yeah. God gave us all this fresh water for a purpose, didn't he? That's right, and it wasn't just to wash away all the junk and the garbage that we don't want anymore. I remember being in New York State with a bunch of teenagers, and we were having a real good time up on a big mountain. And we didn't have to worry about checking the water up there because we talked to the rangers, and the rangers said that the water was really fresh there and good to drink but there are very, very few streams like that anymore because people aren't being concerned or good stewards with all the good fresh water that God has given us. And now we have to dump so much chemical in the water to keep it fresh for us to drink so it's not poisoning us. Yeah, it doesn't make sense how people do all these things. It seems like they don't care what's going on. But it seems like it hurts them when it comes to paying the bills for all of these things, like paying the, the water bill 
for all of the chemicals and the, the chlorine and everything that they put in it to make it safe so we can drink. Yeah, but that's the only time it hurts them. I remember being out fishing one day with you, and remember that big boat that went by? They dumped a whole bucket of junk in the water. I'm afraid, Ricky, that there are a lot of people that aren't concerned until it's too late. Take Lake Erie. Lake Erie's dead. There aren't any fish alive in the lake anymore, and it's really in a bad, bad state of affairs. And I don't know whether they can ever save some of the lakes that are going bad now. And some of the rivers as well. So let's see. How can we help get these fresh water streams clean again and uh, make sure that when we go swimming that there's no broken glass and things like that. Well, we could post signs around the, the rivers and say, please don't throw trash in, but I don't think that's going to really do it, Les. Do you have any better ideas? The government is trying to stop some of the big factories from dumping all the chemicals and things in the water. And if we get behind our government and tell them that we're for them when it comes to this uh, business of keeping our streams clean and our lakes fresh, and write them a letter and tell them that we're behind them and ask them if we can help them, maybe we can see these lakes get cleaned up in a real fast hurry so that we can be able to swim in them without any concern and make sure that we don't get our feet cut like Jane did. Yeah, I think that's a good idea. Now, I think I'm going to go to Sunday school and tell the boys and girls to be very careful when they go swimming because of the glass at the beach. And maybe we can ask them to remind their moms and dads not to throw things in the water. Yeah, because I like to swim and I don't like to get my feet cut. No, and I'm sure Jane's going to be walking around on a bandaged foot for a long time. And that's no fun. a birthday boy or a birthday girl. How nice. What fun you're having with all the things that birthdays bring. And we bring one more thing for all you boys and girls who are celebrating birthdays, and that is a ride on the birthday train. Everybody that has a birthday, get aboard. <coughs> Teresa says to all the birthday children, Many happy returns of the day. May sunshine and gladness be given. And may the dear Father prepare you on earth for that beautiful home up in heaven. God bless each one of you dear birthday children. The Sunbury Junior Singers sing for us, and their song this time, You Can't Stop God.
Mother, said Anne, why do we often end our prayers in Jesus' name? What does that mean? Let me tell you a story said her mother. It may help you to understand what it means to do anything in somebody else's name. And this was the story. A young man named George had a very pretty pony. During the war, George had to join the army. In a battle, he was hit by some bullets and was badly wounded. His buddy crept out to him and pulled him to a safe place. But George knew he was dying. So he wrote on a scrap of paper, I want my father and mother to have everything I own, but I want my buddy to have my pony. And then he signed his name and gave the piece of paper to his friend. George died, and after a while the buddy was sent home. As soon as he could, he went to see George's parents. And while talking to them, he said, uh, I'd like to have George's pony. George's father was surprised and said, oh, I'm sorry, but you can't have it. We want George's brother to have it. Then the soldier showed George's father the slip of paper. The father saw his son's name on the paper. And when he read what his son wanted, he was glad to give the soldier the pony. I get it, said Anne. When the soldier asked in his own name, he didn't get the pony. But when he asked in the son's name, then he got it. So, when we ask God for anything in our own name, we may not get it, but when we ask in Jesus' name for anything he wants us to have, we're sure to get it. Is that right, Mother? asked Anne. Yes, said her mother. Jesus said, Whatever you'll ask the Father in my name, he will give it to you. Isn't that exciting? I think it is.